One of our teenagers, we had our youth night a couple of weeks ago, and he, we didn't quite get to him, so he's going to come preach to us. It's going to take about an hour. <laughs> Why not, brother? Um, I'm going to start off with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, and uh, thank you for this opportunity that I get to preach. Um, please call my nerves and help me to say exactly what you want me to say. And please give us a safe afternoon. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Um, so please turn to Psalm chapter 27. And uh, my verses are 11 and 12. Um, okay, 11 and 12. It says, Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. Deliver me not over unto the will of mine enemies, for false witnesses are risen up against me, as such as breathe out cruelty. Uh, so my sermon is talking about asking for God's help when facing your enemies. Um, we all have enemies just like David did, and we don't know specifically who these enemies were. He had a lot of enemies. But uh, we know that they were physical. We know that they were real people that wanted to kill him. Uh, verse 12, he says that they are false witnesses, which means that they're telling lies about him. They're spreading lies about him. And they breathe out cruelty. So they're threatening him. Um, who are your enemies? Now, our enemies, they can be physical people like David. Or uh, they could be the things of this world that are trying to pull you away from serving God. Uh, they could be your own sinful desires, or of course the devil, who's always trying to pull Christians away from serving God. Uh, but no matter who our enemies are, we don't have the power to overcome them, uh, especially because of our sinful nature. We want to do sinful things. It looks fun, and it's fun for a season. There's pleasure in sin for a season. Uh, in this passage, David realizes that he's in trouble if he doesn't get God's help. So he turns to him in prayer. In verse 11, he says, Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. David knows that God's the answer to his problems. Uh, he asks him to show him a clear path to take so that his enemies don't destroy him. And then in verse 12, Deliver me not over unto the will of mine enemies, for false witness are risen up against me, as such as breathe out cruelty. He specifically asks God to protect him from the will of his enemies. Um, now, we don't know exactly the situation, like I said, but um, we know that uh, God answered his prayer because his enemies weren't successful in defeating him. Uh, we need to ask God for help when we're facing our enemies because he has the power to overcome them, and we don't. Um, this is proven throughout David's life. So in conclusion... God has power over everything, and he's the answer to all our problems. Uh, when we're facing our enemies, we should go to him in prayer. Hey, man, I appreciate that. You better know who your enemies are. And he is right. It is going to the Lord. That is the key. David learned that from a young age. And when he applied that, it worked. No, here and that really fits with where I'm going tonight perfectly. Let's look in the book of Jude. Jude. Jude, uh, I'm looking at two verses right here, three and four of Jude. He said, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you, the common, uh, unto you of the common salvation, it was, need for me to write unto, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Now, I'm not going to get into all that. I'm, I'm just going to go to one aspect here. But, but notice in verse three, I find it interesting. Basically, what he's saying there is, I was going to write unto you about our salvation. But you can see there's another direct. That's not what he writes about. 
He writes about earnestly contending for the faith. But this is what's needed with what's going on. Uh, Verse 4. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go ahead and pray. Father in heaven, Lord, Lord, we, we do love you. Lord, we need you. Lord, I pray for your grace and your mercy, your help here this evening. And I pray that we'd see the truth that we have or that will encourage us, exhort us, and help us to stand strong. Lord, please bless and do meet the needs that are here. Lord, I'm sure there's multitudes of needs that are here, and I know you have the answer. So please do, do the work that needs to be done, Lord. And I pray if there is anyone here that does not know Christ, Lord, we certainly do pray for their salvation this evening. Lord, I pray and ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. I was, I was on a furlough. And when we were in New Guinea, I think my very first furlough sort of in 2007, 2008 time frame. And we had stayed, of course, at the missionary homes for Baptist missionaries in St. Petersburg, Florida. And so I was, we were there at the homes, and, and I got a phone call. I usually travel out a lot. I would take different kids with me and travel out. But I, I happened to be in St. Petersburg, and a call came. And I didn't know it was, I think the director of the home had, had called first. He said, you're going to have some other guy call him. And this guy calls up anyhow. And he says he directs a teen camp here in Florida. And uh, he said, we have a large campgrounds, and we talked for a few minutes. He was a Bob Jones grad, and, and he said, um, I recommend that I call you. I'd like you to have you come preach the teen camp that we have. And so we talked for a little bit, and I said, that, I said that'd be fine. And so anyhow, the, the time comes, and I, and I head there to preach the camp. Just amazing facilities, just really is, just really nice facilities. I even had my own little house as the speaker. And... Um, I met I, now. I, I met the director that afternoon. We had a brief time of fellowship. It was it was good. Then it was time for the evening service, and it was my first time heading into the chapel area. And I was getting in just on purpose, just a little bit late after the thing was starting. Let him get started, and I went in there just two or three minutes after things were moving. You know, it's a laid back. It's camp, and so I was coming in, just going to sit in the back until time for the preaching. And I went in there. I was stunned, shocked. Um, they had playing an outright live rock band. I couldn't believe it. I, I mean, I was just, ooh, dark lights. I mean, this just wasn't even the nonsense of worship leading teams here. It wasn't, wasn't even that. This was a whole nother level. And uh, needless to say, after the service that evening, I went right to the director, and I said, i got to be honest with you, I was stunned at what I saw tonight. And I said, especially you being from Bob Jones. If you know anything about Bob Jones University, they're known for their music. I mean, that's that's one of their main things is music. I mean, you want to learn music, go to Bob Jones. And I said, I said, with 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 the music that just occurred in there tonight, and you being from Bob Jones, and he he was in a golf cart and I was standing and, and he just looked at me and said, he goes, I just didn't want to fight it. And then drove off. Well, we see that so much today. I just don't want to fight. I just don't want to fight it. The nonsense of no longer willing to earnestly contend for the faith. He didn't want to stand up against it. We are seeing more and more of that when it comes to things concerning the faith. People no longer willing to fight. At times, I get it. At times, there's a weariness. You're like, I just don't want to fight this. (laughs) I just don't want to fight this right now. But we have a responsibility to earnestly contend for the faith. Jude is giving the command here. We certainly greatly need it in our day. This book is, now this book teaches really an understanding of apostates. It deals with the last days, such as we're in right now. Uh, we're in a time of where many uh, apostates exist. That's someone who has turned from revealed truth. They know truth and they turn from, they know what's right. And they make a decision to ignore it or turn from it. So this book deals with two things I'm going to put here, duty and danger. The duty is in verse 3. We are to earnestly contend for the faith. That is our duty as Christians. It's the main theme of the entire book. The danger we see is in verse 4. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation on godly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. 
That's the danger we're in. We're seeing that verse played out in our day. We live in a day of darkness, a time when there are doctrines of devils are everywhere. And we need to be able to know the truth and proclaim the truth. Look over in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Chapter 3, excuse me. I think I told you chapter 2. The Bible talks about it in the end times how, in the very first verse, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Those days will come. And then it lists all the different characteristics of the time of the last days, and we're certainly seeing that. We're witnessing it, where people would literally at times, rather hear a lie. Look in chapter 4 now. Come over to chapter 4. When he's exhorting Timothy to stay faithful and stay right, knowing what's coming in the day we're living in, the apostasy that will come, those who will deny truth. He tells him in verse 2, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. He's telling them, contend for the faith. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of the evangelists, make full proof of thy ministry. And then, of course, he gets into how his time is, is over with. He has fought the fight, trying to encourage him to continue, to, to continue the fight. We know from 2 Peter, which is closely related to Jude, there's a lot of similarities, how uh, people will follow in the last days these horrible heresies. We know in 2 Peter chapter 3, it's a time of scoffers. Boy, we have that in our day. So we're seeing, we're seeing this great falling away that the Bible talks about. Those who even, and remember, which well, I'm, I'm going to get ahead of myself, I'm going to slow up. Jude, seeing the problems and all the, the doctrines of devils that existed, is exhorting, please, earnestly contend for the faith. It's something that we have a responsibility to do, to contend for the faith. Some things in Christian life are optional, while others are not. This is not one that's optional. This is not optional. We have to contend for our faith. The ramifications of not contending for the faith will certainly lead only to greater problems in our life and in churches and a farther move away from God. The word contend means to fight for, to fight strenuous, strenuously, to defend vigorously. The fact is we all should contend for the faith. It just isn't about pastors and missionaries. The letter itself is addressed to all. All of us need to be serious about the faith that we have been given. The fact is it's not a game. There are very real enemies against it. Different ways we contend for the faith. We contend for the faith when we stand for what's right in the word of God. We're even contending for the faith to a degree when we're proclaiming the gospel and not watering it down. We contend for the faith when we help strengthen those who are teaching and preaching the word of God. We contend for the faith when we resist error, calling it by name. And by the way, let me just bring this up. Understand the day we live in right now, sincerity is not the test for fellowship. Truth is. <clears throat> the faith we are called to contend for is this body of doctrine that we have been given to us. The central part, of course, definitely being the gospel, which is often attacked. Attacked and attacked. <clears throat> I'll get more into that in a second. Some helps as we contend for the faith. If we're going to contend for something, we have to contend with conviction. To contend for something that you're passionate about. When, when for instance, if, if we can look at our nation today, there's certain things that where our nation is so divided that people are passionate about. You get into politics. 
You, you can find some people maybe that you work with or some are passionate about it. You can tell what things when they argue what they're passionate about, what they're arguing about from a point of conviction. You can see the passion that comes with it. When it comes to our faith, boy, do we need to argue from a place of conviction. Earnestly contend. You're not going to earnestly contend from anything unless you have conviction about it. Unless you have that understanding, that strong belief. And really, there's no, this, there could be nothing greater to contend for. It's not the Republican Party. It's, it's not Ohio State's better than Michigan. That's a given. We don't have to contend for that. We need to contend based on our convictions. If you don't really believe the doctrines that are taught here, you're certainly not going to contend for them. Many in the past certainly have given us a pattern on earnestly contending for the faith. It's why you and I have it right now. There are those who have given their life for the faith. <clears throat> the Bible talks, and look really over in Galatians, I believe it's chapter 1. <clears throat> the Bible can be pretty clear when it comes to those who turn from error, preach another gospel. Let me see if I'm remembering right here. Yeah. Galatians chapter 1, verse number 6. This church had the exact same problem that Jude was talking about. I'm going to get to it because the key is the dangers in verse 4. What happens? Well, what happened in verse 4 happened at the churches in Galatia. He says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Now understand this. If you talk to a member or the pastors of one of those churches, they would not tell you, we now believe another gospel. Paul's letting them know you are believing another gospel. What you're following now isn't right. Well, what happened? He said, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Because there's only one true gospel, that's it. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which you have preached unto you, let him be accursed. He's pretty clear. If you have somebody else coming into your church that is preaching any other form of the gospel, we're done. Let him be accursed. We have to contend with conviction. Secondly, that has to be mixed with compassion. I think the best way to be most effective, even Jude's going to get into that, by the way, later on, I'm not going to go there, but Jude gets into that himself. Conviction with compassion. I think they go hand in hand to be effective. We contend strongly and vigorously, exactly as the word describes it, and it is tempered with our compassion. In other words, we need to make sure that our, our, our desire when we contend, because we're all flesh, the devil's smart, and a lot of times, your own flesh doesn't always need the devil to throw you off track. I assure you of that. Your heart is desperately wicked. But listen to me, I've seen this. You can earnestly contend for the faith, and all of a sudden, it simply comes about you being right. Not about the faith. Not about actually seeing somebody converted. Not about having, being ready to answer every man so you can try and persuade. You just want to be Right? That's not of compassion. That's of your pride. <clears throat> it's not about being right. It's about protecting our faith. I think we also must contend continually. We cannot let up. Again, as I mentioned, you can grow weary. I mean, there's some of the battles that as, as times are changing, and I'm just being honest, I'm flesh just like anybody else. There's some of the battles that take place, and I'm just like... But the fact is, we can't let up. The devil is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He's not letting up. He's not letting up. It is our duty to never stop contending for the faith. Know when our rest is? It's coming. Our rest is coming. 
Now, let's go back to Jude in verse 4. When he says, makes a statement how we're to earnestly contend for the faith, he says, listen, this is what's going on here. Verse 4, this is how it happens. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into a... Boy, do we see that so much today. I mean, just reading, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, certain men have crept in unaware. In others, when they came in, they seemed like they were like anyone else in the church, but the fact is they were not. This battle starts from within a church, where the changes begin to take place, the talking begins, the turning from truth. Understand this, apostates go away from the truth. They don't necessarily go away from church. They like church. We live in a day right now, let's love everybody, let's all get along, let's not fight, let's be tolerant. The fact is, we have to fight. Look over in Paul's words in Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. The Bible says in verse 28, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Remember, this is where he's gathered all the pastors in the area when he came back into Ephesus and just giving him his heart here. He said, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Boy, he's pleading with them. Don't forget, hold on to what I've given you. This body of doctrine, hold on. He said, there's going to be voices rising up from within you who are going to try and turn you from it. We can think of churches that probably many of us know, maybe churches that you used to be a member of, we've got a lot of military here, that now they're just completely different. We have to be on guard. Paul gives the warning out here. He's saying, listen, remember, three years I told you this. That was his biggest concern when he was gone, that they wouldn't be... Prepared, they wouldn't be ready, and all of a sudden, somebody will come in with those, those soothing words or those, those uh, manipulative words and those pulling words, pulling them away from truth. Paul knew the reality of that. Listen, this is such a danger because the church is the pillar and ground for the truth. If we don't hold for it and contend for it, who will? And, of course, verse 4 makes clear God, obviously God knows, he's all knowing that this would happen, that these men would come in, behold, uh, those before of old ordained to this condemnation. And, again, when we look at churches today, we see many that used to preach truth and stand for truth, but they have changed. What happened? Certain men crept in unaware. I remember I was in a church, which I'm sure they took care of it, because as far as I know, the church didn't change. Um, They did not change. It was a Sunday afternoon, I was in Louisiana, and uh, preaching for a church I'd never been in, it was a cold call, and, and I got in earlier that afternoon, I think around 2 or 3 o'clock, and I went in their foyer and set up the display, and, 
and uh, choir practice was taking place. And I, so I just sat in the last pew. It was pretty much empty, you know, kind of like they did choir practice in an auditorium. And I, I was just about the only one ever besides the choir. Um, and I sat in the back on that side and just listened to the choir practice, and it was fine. But then I listened to their choir director speak. And, and it, 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 I, was, I was, red flags went up, I'll put it that way. Red flags went up all over the place when I heard his words to the choir. And, and he was talking of how there was things he wanted to change that the pastor didn't agree with yet, with the choir. We're not talking going to a more sound place with the music, but I can't remember his words. This is my words for it, but he meant like, you know, to modernize it. You know, let's, you know, give the people what they want. <clears throat> Listen, it happens. It happens. I remember I had one guy ready to join our church here. This was in 2019. 2019. And I knew him a little bit. I had actually, actually met him years ago, years ago. And started to attend and came to me and said, man, he wanted to join. And, uh, um, and I was excited. I said, you know, same thing. Here's our church doctrines, policies. Come on in and, and we'll talk about it. And I just didn't think he would agree with him. And so we met and he said he did. And now it'd be easy for me to pass. He said with his own mouth, I agree with it. But I just knowing him, I just knew there were certain things on here he didn't agree with unless he had changed. And so things like this came to mind. I said, listen, I, and I, of course, it'd be nice to have, as a pastor, you love when people join. Yes. You love seeing people here. Love, it'd be great if every single seat was filled. I want people to join every service. If you guys can have people join every service, I'm for it. I am. Love it. <clears throat> and so he told me, and I could have let it go at that. And, my, and be honest, the temptation was there. Let it go. He said it. You're good. You're good. Honestly, I had that thought. Let it go. You're good. So I said, I said, brother, I know you. And I brought up a doctrinal issue. I said, do you agree with that? He said, no, but I won't hurt you with it. And I said, oh, man. <laughs> and anyhow, that was his last service here at that time. <clears throat> the Bible's clear on this. We have to earnestly contend for the faith. We have to be aware because many times where it starts is from within. <clears throat> and the churches, and you can think of the churches, the things that they battled in the first century that were coming in. I mean, really, the... the the fact of only the grace of God and the power of God able to sustain them. True and true. I mean, remember they don't even have the in, the entire New Testament to go to. Only pieces of it, and they dealt with some major doctrinal heresies coming in. Huge stuff. The Judaizers. That's not a small issue when you read about that in the Bible. They were changing the gospel itself. That's what happened in Galatia. I mean, they literally left the preaching of the gospel. Then you get into the other weird stuff that was coming in, Gnosticism. I mean, I mean, we're dealing with churches that we're getting into. That's, remember when we went through, what was it, uh, when we got into 1 John and whatnot. I mean, there was, there was churches struggling with the idea because false teachers had come in. Basically, in the flesh, you can do whatever you want. It's flesh, it's going to sin, do whatever you want. I mean, I mean, they dealt with some major, major problems that they had to handle. The Bible talks about Romans chapter 16 and verse 17. We must mark and avoid them which, who teach contrary to the doctrine we have received. It's one thing that I, that I really, this was the first church that I joined. I'm almost positive. I haven't joined a lot, obviously. I'm not a church, I'm just from military, going place to place. Um, New Mexico, we had joined one and that church split and fell apart. Then we went to Berean and then Korea. And then here. Um, and Breen was a great church. Korea was a great, you know, very good that worked there in Korea and then here. But this was the only one of those that I joined 
where you're given a copy of the church doctrines and beliefs and saying, read that and tell us you're in agreement first. Most of them, if you haven't been baptized, you're baptized, you remember, that's it. We got you. There's a measure of protection there for us, by the way. A measure of protection there. They turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. Just basically do whatever they wanted to do. There, there's a book that, that talks about just that, how he can read this verse and write that book. The name is, a, is it Grace Awakening? I'm trying to remember. It's just, wow, under the guise of helping the Christian life. But boy, I believe what that book set in motion going back, what was that, late 80s, 90s, I can't remember, has just been devastating. But we have a responsibility to earnestly contend for the faith. The battle is real. We have to understand what we have and how precious it is. Listen, there, there's not a one of us in here. We're a church, we're a homeschooling church, a church of families. There, there, there's, there's not a family in here that you would do your best if you, to, to defend your family if you saw a major problem coming in. You saw something, you would defend it. You would. You'd say, no, this, i got to stop this. Well, as a church, what Jude is pointing out, and Paul pointed out, Peter pointed out, by the way, Jude just put it direct. We have to earnestly contend for the faith. That means that striving, that fighting, that needs to happen. We need the wisdom to do that. We need the grace to do that, the conviction to do that, the compassion to do that, and stay faithful at it, not to be worrying well done with. Heads bowed and eyes closed. First, let me ask this. If you're here right now and you are not certain that heaven is your home, maybe your salvation, this thing has been bothering you, say, listen, I need to get this settled. I need to talk with somebody or I need somebody to pray, uh, pray for me. You say, listen, pastor, I am not certain that if I died that I would go to heaven. Please, I need you to pray for me. Would you just raise your hand where I can see this? Just raise your hand. Let me acknowledge it and you can put it back down. Just put your hand up for me real quick. I just see some small children is all I see. Anybody. All right, Christian. Listen, we have a lot going on in our lives at times. We really do. We can get caught up in many of the cares of this world. One of the primary things we are as a Christian, of course, one, our life is about glorifying God, but a responsibility we begin as an ambassador for Christ. And after that is to earnestly contend for the faith, to be willing to stand for truth and what's right. That's just not me. That's us as a church. Anyhow, if the Lord worked on your heart, you come and pray. Father in heaven, uh, I pray that you bless this invitation, work in hearts and lives. So I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's all stand to our feet. Turn to page 571. If you have something you need to come pray about, you come pray.